very briefly, my name is John Malcolm. I am the uh, chairman of the criminal law practice group, and so this is my plug for the practice group. We have a very active executive committee. Uh, we put on programs and write articles on a whole variety uh, of areas, and if you are interested in, uh, in criminal law and interested in learning more about the practice group or possibly getting involved uh, in the practice group, I would urge you all to either catch me uh, uh, while I'm here during the convention. I'm also at the Heritage Foundation. You can track me down uh, down there, and I would love to uh, hear from you. I'm going to turn this over in just a moment to my, uh, my friend, uh, Judge Lisa, Lisa Branch. Lisa and I have actually known each other for, uh, for a number of years. We uh, were in Atlanta together, and we came up to work in the Bush administration, uh, and a whole contingency of us came up, and we were referred to at the time as the Atlanta Mafia. And um, I'm, of course, uh, here. She has gone back to Atlanta and on to uh, greater things, and is a brand new judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. So please join me in welcoming Judge Lisa Branch. And thank you for uh, coming to our panel today, our criminal law panel. And we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of plea bargaining. Um, today, approximately 95% of criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargaining. Um, and our panelists today are going to talk about the <coughs> tensions that are inherent in this uh, in increasing frequency of such a practice. Are plea bargains a necessary part of the criminal justice system? Um, in his dissent in uh, Lafleur v. Cooper, Justice Scalia noted that the ordinary criminal process has become too long, too expensive, and unpredictable. And, and really, could the, could the system function if these numbers were to decrease? But are plea bargains too coercive? And is there a solution that's needed, or is there a solution that's, that's even possible? And our panelists are going to shed light on these issues. Um, just to give you a, a, an idea of how we're going to proceed with this panel, I'm going to introduce them, um, in the, and they're in the order they're going to speak. They'll present their arguments briefly on the topic, and then they may have questions of each other, and I may have questions for them. And I hope to leave about 15 to 20 minutes for the audience to ask some questions. And you'll see we have two microphones set up. I can't because of that light, I can't really see that one, but I'll just go back and forth between the two. Um, and let me start with Greg Brower. He is a shareholder at uh, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek, and he focuses on civil and criminal litigation. Mo uh, most recently, he served as the assistant director for the Office of Congressional Affairs at the FBI. He's also served as the FBI's deputy general counsel, and he's had many other important roles. He was the U.S. attorney for the District of Nevada. He served five terms in the Nevada legislature, and he's an adjunct professor of law at the University of Nevada. And um, before he attended law school, he served in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer. Greg, as a former prosecutor, is going to be the most pro-plea bargain of the panel. Um, Clark Neely is the Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. Before he joined Cato, he was a senior attorney and constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice, and he's an adjunct professor at the University of Texas School of Law. He will be the most critical of plea bargains. Um, professor Carissa Hessick is, a, is the Ransdall Distinguished Professor of Law at, the, um, at UNC Law. Uh, she clerked for Judge Barbara Jones on the Southern District of New York and Judge Ra Ra Randolph on the DC Circuit. She also has served in private practice in New York City. Um, in, in her discussion today, she's going to talk about how plea bargains are not the cause of the dysfunction in the criminal justice system. And last but not least, we will get to Judge Stefano Bibas. He is a U.S. Uh, circuit judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Um, he clerked for Justice Kennedy. He's also served as an AUSA for the Southern District of New York, and he was a professor of law and criminology at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And what he's going to talk about today, he's going to focus on the balancing of these competing interests, how plea bargaining avoids democratic oversight, but it also responds to problems like, uh, for, for judges, like mandatory minimums. And so with that, we, I will turn it over to Mr. Brower. Well, thank you very much, Judge, and uh, I'm sure everybody can hear me okay. 
Uh, and thanks, John, for kicking this off. It's, uh, it's great to see so many people here late in the day. I was reminded as I uh, walked in today that uh, this, this is my, my first time speaking on a panel at the Lawyers' Convention, but it's not my first convention. I, uh, I was able to recall that my first was the fall of 1989 when I was a 1L at GW Law here in town, and I was a, a volunteer here for the, for the convention. It's, so it's, uh, it's been almost 30 years, and I guess that says a lot about the Federal Society's staying power and, and something about me getting old as well. So, But it is a very, uh, very much a privilege for me to be here, so thank you. So plea bargains, um, controversial. Uh, traditionally, law and order conservatives would like to criticize plea bargains as uh, evincing a soft on crime approach by too many prosecuting offices. More recently, uh, those on the other side of the spectrum uh, have been uh, uh, known to criticize plea bargains as being unfair to defendants. I would submit that neither is quite accurate. Uh, it is true, as the judge mentioned, that upwards of 95% of cases are resolved by way of plea bargains or some other type of plea. It's rare to see defendants just do a, what we call a straight up plea, but that happens from time to time. Most plea deals are done by way of a, a deal, a bargain. But I would submit that uh, not only is that reality okay, uh, but that it is actually a good thing. And in fact, I would submit that it, given the realities of our criminal justice system, it's more than a good thing, it's a necessary thing. The system simply could not uh, survive, could not exist, could not be um, efficient without most cases being resolved by way of a plea deal. Nevertheless, criticism persists from, as I said, the left and the right. So what I thought I would, what I would do today is just tee up a few of those critiques and try to offer uh, my response, and then I look forward to, of course, other points of view and to uh, questions if we have time. So let me talk about a few of the more popular criticisms of the, of the system of plea bargaining. Uh, the first uh, criticism that we hear is that the jury trial is the anchor of our criminal justice system, and so the fact that there are so few jury trials means there must be something wrong with the system. Actually, I, I think it's more accurate to say that the right to a jury trial is the anchor of our criminal justice system. And that is the defendant's right, as we all know. The people have no right, I would submit, in seeing criminal cases tried. Of course, let me modify that. When criminal cases are tried, of course, the people have a right to see those trials. But the people do not have a collective right that those, those cases be tried. It's the defendant's right. And when the defendant, in agreement with the government, decides that accepting a plea deal is preferable to going to trial, again, when an agreement is reached, uh, the, the right of the defendant has been satisfied. Now, let me, let me say that as a trial lawyer, and I've, I've done my share of jury trials, and as a litigator, I think it's, it's the most fun that one can have as a litigator is to try a case. Um, I would also observe that for each case one tries, you, one loses about a year of one's life <laughs> on the back end. Uh, but it's not about the prosecutors or the defense lawyers having fun. And it's really not even about, as some judges, although a minority, would suggest, it's not about judges wanting to see more jury trials. It's really about the defendant's right to decide whether he or she wants to go to trial. The second criticism we hear is that plea deals are done in the back room, they're secretive, and there's no transparency. For any of us who have been involved in the process, uh, we know that that's not exactly how it works. There may be backroom negotiating, but there inevitably is, with every plea bargain, an on-the-record, in-open-court recitation of the deal with very careful cross-examination by the judge of the defendant in terms of the voluntariness of the plea and the details of the plea, and at the end of the day, approval by the judge of the deal. So at the end of the process, it is a very transparent, on the record, in open court, part of the docket process. 
third, uh, there is uh, the criticism that plea deals are somehow coercive and as a result unfair as against the defendant. And I just have to say in my experience, uh, I've not seen that. I've heard about it. It no doubt happens from time to time, probably at the state level more than the federal level. But it is a rare, rare thing I would submit at the federal level. The fundamental reasons why it's rare is because DOJ policy prohibits it, and ethical rules also prohibit it. So the, the AUSA who tries to engage in coercive plea bargaining uh, will likely be revealed to be engaged in such a, an improper practice and won't get away with it and won't be around long. And so it's just not something I think that is a problem such that it suggests there's a problem with the system. So the bottom line uh, for me is that the Constitution provides in two ways for the propriety of plea bargains. The first is that given the Constitution's separation of powers, it is, as we all know, exclusively within the executive branch that decisions in, with respect to how to prosecute, when to prosecute, and whom to prosecute are exclusively within the executive branch's power. And secondly, the, the, the right to go to trial, the criminal defendant's right, the constitutional right, is exclusively with the defendant. And so between those two constitutional realities, I would suggest that the, the right to plea bargain is something that is constitutionally sound, and moreover, it is something that common sense and the reality of our criminal justice system mandate be available to the parties in every criminal case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. And now we will turn it to Mr. Neely. Well, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers Joe Pesci's opening argument and my cousin Vinny, um, but I want to assure you that that is not going to be <laughs> my opening argument in this case. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so the, uh, the status of the jury trial um, in uh, American law is somewhat unique. Article 3, Section 2 provides that the trial of all crimes shall be by jury. The Bill of Rights spends more words on the, subjects of, on the subject of juries than any other topic. The right to a jury trial is the only right that is mentioned both in the body of the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. It is literally impossible to overstate the Founders' commitment to the proposition that the administration of criminal justice should be one in which the public is intimately involved intimately involved. It depends on public participation for legitimacy, for transparency, for accountability, and for people to have faith in the integrity of the system. I want to read a quote from the Supreme Court in a case called In Re Winship from 1970. The court said, it is critical that the moral force of the criminal law not be diluted by a standard of proof or a procedure for conviction that leaves people in doubt about whether innocent men are being condemned. And we know to an absolute certainty that innocent people routinely plead guilty to crimes in America. And I'll get to how we know that in a moment, but it is absolutely true, and that's problematic. Uh, I want to read another quote. I was actually just chatting with uh, Judge Elrod out in the hallway, and I had the great pleasure of being able to tell her that I had literally this morning copied out of a judicial opinion a quote, not her opinion, another opinion, a quote from a 2011 Law Review article that she wrote responding to the assertion that the criminal justice system would essentially grind to a halt without plea bargaining. Here's what Judge Elrod said about that. When the myth of a backlog court, or a judicial system, sorry, when the myth of backlog courts is raised as the reason for forsaking the jury, we must correct them. It is not the case that America's criminal justice system would come to a grinding halt without plea bargaining. It is simply the case that plea bargaining is more efficient than jury trials are. Well, there's no question about that. But the question is whether that is a feature or a bug. And I submit that the founders would clearly have said that it is not a feature, um, but that it is a bug.
Let me say this um, about plea bargaining. It was unknown at the founding era. It is virtually alien to the entire history of the common law. Um, by the way, it was well known on the continent where judicially sanctioned torture was permitted through much of the Middle Ages. They know a lot about plea bargaining in the, in, in, on the continent, but not in Anglo-American law. Um, and I want to just quickly run through uh, what some of the problems are. Let's, let's talk about just first these numbers. 97.4% of all federal criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargain. Are, is that not an incredibly suspicious number? Why on earth are so few people interested in exercising one of the most hallowed and hard-won rights in the entire Constitution? I, too, got my start as a trial lawyer. I have tried cases to a jury. I understand that they can sometimes be unpredictable, um, and they are certainly inefficient. Uh, but to the party that does not bear the burden of proof, a trial is extraordinarily uh, beneficial. All kinds of things can happen that can cause your opponent to fail to carry their burden, especially when it's a burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Witnesses can forget or not show up. The chain of custody can be broken. Uh, juries can just take an, uh, uh, an unpredicted uh, uh, like to one of the parties. So there's lots of reasons why you would go to trial even if you were guilty. So why do so few people um, in our system go to trial anymore? And there's one word there is exactly one word that explains why, and that is coercion. The lifeblood of American criminal justice today is coercion. Um, it is very difficult to define the difference between a, an appropriately uh, attractive inducement on the one hand and an inappropriately coercive offer on the other, but let me give you one example. Um, there was a, a young man who was an internet genius named Aaron Schwartz. He helped invent Reddit when he was 19 years old. Um, he, uh, as a graduate student at Harvard, <clears throat> had access to the JSTOR database, the academic database. He was only allowed to download three articles per day. He felt that the result was that a bunch of human knowledge was sort of being held up behind this arbitrary dam, um, and so he created a computer program to download essentially the entire body of, of uh, articles from JSTOR. He broke into a computer closet at MIT, hooked up a laptop, and began running the program. He was originally uh, prosecuted by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, <clears throat> but then the federal government took over. Um, by the time they got done charging Aaron Schwartz, he was facing a 13-count federal indictment uh, that exposed him to 35 years in prison and a $1 million fine. <clears throat> they may know what his plea offer was? Six months. Six months. Tell me that's not coercive. Um, by the way, we don't know what his sentence was because he killed himself during plea negotiations. Um, the... What makes plea bargaining coercive? Well, there's a number of factors that come together. I don't have time to go through all of them, but the three major factors are these. First, pretrial detention. If you are sitting in Rikers Island, which is hell on earth, having a very difficult time connecting with your defense counsel, helping to participate in your defense, finding documents, identifying witnesses, sharing phone numbers, etc., just getting a face-to-face -face meeting is very difficult. It's hard to, it's hard to uh, participate in a vigorous defense. It's also a very, very unpleasant place to be. Um, Second, we have um, woefully inadequate defense counsel in most jurisdictions. 80% of people who uh, are prosecuted in America have a, uh, a public defender, and in many jurisdictions they are wildly under-resourced. And here's a secret, conflicted. Why? Because they have to maintain a good relationship with the prosecutors in that jurisdiction. Why? To ensure they get favorable plea offers for all of their clients. So it can be dangerous for a, a, a public defender to dig in hard or too hard in some cases. And finally, we have the infamous trial penalty, which is the difference between the plea that you are, or the sentence that you are offered if you take the plea and the, the sentence that will be imposed if you go to trial and lose. And uh, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers just came out with a study this year called the, the, the Trial Penalty. Look it up. Read it. You should know about it. If you are an American citizen, you should know about the trial pen penalty. It is horrifying. Um, all right, so what problems are there with, with coercive plea bargaining? Well, first there's the innocence problem I alluded to before. What percentage of people who plead guilty uh, to crimes are in fact innocent? The answer, of course, is we have no idea. The Innocence Project has uh, exonerated about 300 people using DNA evidence. That's not perfect, but it's as close as we can get in our system. Fully 10% of those 300 exonerees confessed to crimes that they did not commit. A deeply, deeply troubling number. Uh, another problem is a supra-optimal amount of prosecution. As I suggested earlier, the inefficiency of jury trials is not a bug. It is a feature of the system. It imposes discipline, or is meant to impose discipline on the prosecution about what cases they bring, and only bring the most serious cases against the people who really shouldn't be out on the street. Um, there also are problems with accountability and transparency that we can get into in a moment, and finally, with legitimacy. 
a system in which we cannot have faith in the integrity of any particular conviction, and I would say that a conviction that is obtained through plea negotiations that take place behind closed doors and where the government is not required to put its evidence out in public for all of us to see is a process in which we cannot have faith in the integrity of any particular conviction, and that is a huge problem for the legitimacy of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. I feel certain that at the end we're going to loop back to Mr. Brower. I feel certain you may have some things you want to say. <laughs> took um, some notes. <laughs> great. Uh, we're going to turn over to Professor uh, Hessek right now. Great. Thank you very much, Judge Branch, and thank you all very much for being here today. Um, I'm working on a big project about plea bargaining, and I've just been annoying my friends and family talking to them, and now you can all share in that, and maybe <laughs> I can um, talk about something else at dinner. Um, so I agree with a lot of what Clark had to say. I consider myself to be a critic of the plea bargaining system that we have in this country, but I think that I view it through a slightly different lens than he does. Um, so for example, I don't think that the problem is simply um, defendants who are facing incredibly, incredibly long sentences who are offered incredibly, incredibly short sentences. Like the example that he gave of the young man um, who had downloaded all of the documents from JSTOR. Um, for this project, for this book project I'm working on, I was speaking to a public defender in the Bronx and he told me that he has never been able to convince a client to reject a plea deal, no matter how bad that plea deal was, if it included immediate release from detention. He told me specifically about one client who, because he was on probation, if he pleaded guilty without trying to negotiate further, and get the charge dropped down from a misdemeanor to, um, uh, uh, to a, I forget what it's called, but um, like a, a sanction, essentially, to a ticket. Something that the defense attorney thought that he'd be able to do, but he needed two more days. He wouldn't stay in jail for two more days, knowing he would be revoked on probo probation for another case that he was on, he ended up spending an additional year in prison. I give that example because I think when most people talk about plea bargaining, they want to think about plea bargaining in terms of the rational actor. They want to say we should only have plea bargains um, where a rational, innocent person wouldn't take them. I'm just not so sure that we can use the frame of rationality when we're talking about these sorts of things. I think that we have to be worried about the idea that defendants are acting irrationally and we should be especially concerned about that because the idea of plea bargaining is premised on the idea of negotiation and contract. And if we know, if we have very good evidence that one side in that negotiation is not looking out for their own interests, then maybe we should stop thinking of it as a negotiation and a contract. Um, I also think about plea bargaining not just as something that's problematic in individual cases, but I think about it in terms of a culture. We have a system of plea bargaining, not just because of the statistics that have been mentioned, but because the default assumption in our system is that a case will be negotiated, that a defendant will take a guilty plea, and that a trial will not occur. So another story from the book, um, there was a young man, relatively recent graduate from law school, went to go work for a public defender's office. As he was negotiating with the prosecutor, if he didn't get what, a good enough deal for his client, he would set the case for trial. Pandemonium ensued. The prosecutor's office was very upset, but so was the public defender's office. His supervisors came to him and said, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm sending these cases for trial. And they're like, why are you doing that? He's like, well, I can't get a good plea offer from the prosecutors. They're like, right, but you're setting them for trial. And he's like, right, isn't that what we're supposed to do if we can't get a good enough plea bargain? And they said, no, that's not what we're supposed to do. Right, our office can't do that. The prosecutors will be angry with us. The judges will be angry with us. That's not what you do. And so he got moved to appeals and now he's very happy. <laughs> But I do want to be clear, right, the problem of plea bargaining isn't new, right? The assumption that cases will plead isn't new, right? It's, it's, it's gotten worse, right? The percentages that Clark mentioned have gone up. But the assumption that cases would plead has been around for quite some time, right? So Albert Altshuler, he's a law professor, he, he did this big study of plea bargaining in the 70s and the 80s. And he'd go around the courtrooms and he tells this story of multiple judges telling defendants 
look, the prosecutor's given you an offer, right? This wasn't mandatory minimums. This wasn't sentencing guidelines. This is before all of that. And so the prosecutor's giving you an offer. If you plead guilty, right, I will give you this sentence. If you go to trial and the jury convicts you, I will give you this sentence. And the only reason I think that judges could do that, because I think that I think most judges are good people and don't think of themselves as sitting around violating people's rights, is that we actually assume that most cases will plead guilty. We assume that that's what's going to happen in particular cases. And the sentences that we give out to people for pleading guilty are actually the sentences that we think are appropriate. Now, here's where I do disagree with Clark. I think that Clark thinks what we need to do is we need to get rid of plea bargaining or we need to just take steps that will discourage plea bargaining. Okay, he and I will fight about this later at the reception if you guys want to come find us. <laughs> Here's my concern. As, even though I think, look, I think plea bargaining is a big problem, right? I'm writing a whole book about it. But I don't think that it's our only problem. And if we were to get rid of plea bargaining, I don't think that it would really fix the criminal justice system. In fact, it could very well make things worse. Right? The really harsh sentences that we've enacted, the mandatory minimums, they'd apply to a whole bunch of people and not just the people who decided to go to trial. Um, the defense attorneys who don't have the time and resources to plea bargain cases certainly aren't going to have the time and resources to bring those cases to trial. And I also, I'm actually just not sure that trials are a panacea. So last story from the book, I promise. A couple of weeks ago, I was out in Western North Carolina interviewing a man who pleaded guilty to a crime he didn't commit, a murder. He pleaded guilty to a murder that he didn't commit. And we go through the whole interview, and at the very end, I think to myself, oh, I, I, I forgot to ask the golden question. I've got to get the sound bite. And I say to him, do you regret pleading guilty? And he said no. And I was shocked. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, why... Why, why do you not regret pleading guilty? You didn't commit this crime. And he really didn't commit the crime. He's subsequently been exonerated. They found DNA evidence. Um, his conviction was vacated. He did not, the, the actual murderer has been found. He did not do it. And I was just flummoxed. How on earth could he not regret pleading guilty to a crime he didn't commit? He said he expected that he would have been convicted. He, to this day, thinks that he would have been convicted had he gone to trial. His only regret was that he didn't get a better plea bargain from the prosecutors. He didn't trust the system to sort the innocent from the guilty. And you know what? I'm not so sure he's wrong. He's a poor kid in Western North Carolina with a court-appointed attorney who told him he'd taken three cases like that to trial before and lost. I don't think that plea bargaining is very good, but I don't think that we should kid ourselves that trials are magic and that they necessarily allow us to figure out who's innocent and who's guilty. Guilty people get acquitted and innocent people get convicted. The 90% of other people on the Innocence Registry, the Innocence Project's web website, they went to trial and they didn't do it and they got convicted. So I guess my point is, I'll end on a very happy note by saying plea bargaining is bad, other things are also very bad. Uh, thank you, uh, Carissa, and um, I feel like Clark may have some response to you later, but um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, let me turn last but not least uh, to Judge Beavis. Thank you. Um, how many of you have seen those uh, black and white uh, pit drawings or illusions where you look at it one way, it's a rabbit, the other way it's a duck, or you look at it one way, it's a young woman, the other way it's an old woman? Like, we're, people in federal society tend to be pretty supportive of free market logic, it seems pretty intuitive, but we also get the idea of separation of powers, checks and balances, and the rule of law for individual liberty. And so I think a lot of you in this room can see both sides of why I think Mr. Brower and Mr. Neely are both right, but it depends on how you look at it. And we should be not so troubled from one point of view and pretty troubled from another point of view. So the private market perspective. Plea bargaining makes all the people in the courtroom better off. The defendant gets a lower sentence, gets his case over with, gets predictability. The prosecutor gets to pursue more cases, ensure more public safety. The judge clears his or her docket. What's there not to like? 
In terms of coercion, the private market transactions make parties better off. It's economics 101, right? Well, how could anyone argue with that? Well, here's the other thing. We're not selling a sack of potatoes. We're selling justice. So from a public governance perspective, from the private perspective, it can't be coercive if people agree to it. From a public governance perspective, from the point of view of the outsiders, the victims, the citizens who are wondering what's going on here, it looks pretty different. So you heard there was a discussion about whether or not this is consistent with the Constitution. Well, the Sixth Amendment says the defendant has a right. Mr. Brower says it's waivable. But Article Three, Section 2 doesn't say the defendant shall have the right. It says the trial of all criminal cases shall be by jury. The wording is non-waivable in the body of the Constitution, all right? Then you look at the issue about secrecy. Well, to the people inside the process, I was a prosecutor, the prosecutors understand, the defense lawyers understand, the judges understand. I'm not so sure the defendants always understand what's going on, but the victims and the public wonder, why has my case been bartered away? Did I have any say? Did I understand what's going on? So it depends on who's, who's looking at it. Take this issue of what's coercive. Again, market participants inside the system, from the lawyer's point of view, it's not coercive, better off. But what about a different definition of coercion? What about taking Professor Hessek's point? Who's setting the baseline here? Well, when prosecutors persuade legislators to stack up more sentences, they stack up more plea bargaining chips. If your baseline were common law, kind of a retributively proportional sentence, yeah, you just look at it as a discount that makes people better off. But when the person who's bargaining has influence over what the baseline sentence is, Suddenly you're in a world where Professor Hessek said the default sentence is not what was the right sentence for someone who went to trial, but what's the right sentence for someone who pleads guilty and then we're going to thwack the few people who are obstinate enough to go to trial. All right? And I think that the fact that it is rational for a number of innocent people to plead guilty should be a canary in the coal mine. I probably wouldn't have a lot of problems with plea bargaining if the discount were really proportional to the chance of acquittal and the time saved, right? A modest discount, 10%, 20%, probably not gonna tempt innocent people to plead guilty. But there are plenty of cases out there, like the case of Weldon Angelos out in Utah, where the prosecutors are happy to take a plea to 15 years, I think it was, or 20, something like that, but he refuses to play ball and suddenly it's an 85 year sentence they're looking at after trial because of stacking mandatory minima and, recit and you know, enhancements and things like that. So the power over the baseline should give us pause. Is the baseline retributive or is the baseline purely a being used to stack up plea bargaining chips? Now what's troubling about this is the way that the Constitution sets up its criminal justice system creates a popular check on all three branches of government. The legislature can criminalize something, but the jury has to make sure it fits. The prosecutor can push it ahead for this defendant but the jury can say no. And the judge doesn't get to direct a verdict of guilty. So all three branches still are subject to a communal check, someone who's not professionalized, someone who's not jaded. And that has some public benefits. The quotation from Winship I thought was apposite, but there's the benefit of seeing justice done, of having one's day in court. And there's the benefit of making sure there are adversarial checks on what actually happens so that truth wins out. I think from the point of view of non-lawyers, I'm setting aside, we prosecutors understand this, ex-prosecutors understand this better, not to non-lawyers, to victims, to members of the public, to, to a fair number of defendants and their families. The system looks hidden, it looks insular, and there's a lot of discretion. I'm not so troubled by discretion per se. What troubles me is idiosyncratic, unchecked discretion. If the discretion is reviewable, if it's tethered to common sense notions of blame and culpability that are verified through a fact-finding process, I'm not so troubled. So one, we historically did that through the adversarial process. We've bypassed that in most cases. Now we have, it's kind of a bastardized inquisitorial process, some scholars argue. But it doesn't really have the checks of continental inquisitorial system either because it doesn't really involve a neutral adjudicator. Again. I'm less troubled in some categories of cases than others. Uh, I was a little surprised. Mr. Brower and I both served in the federal system. Mr. Brower thought the problems were fewer in the federal. I'm going to suggest some reasons why I think the problems are worse in the federal system than the state system. First of all, the sentences are higher, a lot higher in the federal system. 
and there are more mandatory minima, which I'm going to come back to, and recidivism enhancements and the like. Second, more importantly, the bread and butter of what state courts deal with are mala in se, inherently wrongful actions. There's an intuitive sense of justice the individual prosecutor has, that the prosecutor's supervisor has, that the victim has, that the judge has, that they're going to constrain the prosecutor from giving away the store in a murder case, for example, right? In federal court, a lot of what we're dealing with are mala prohibita, where it's, there's widely, much more widely varying perceptions of how wrongful the acts are. So there's not the same kind of intuitive shared baseline that Paul Robinson and psychologists and people have documented that we all share a sense of how much punishment this should get. And that probably has some tempering effect in a state system with mala in se, without a lot of sentencing rules. The other reason there's more checks in the state systems is the states, some of them don't have sentencing guidelines, and those that do don't tend to have ones that are as, as, as rigid as the federal ones are. Even post Booker, the federal guidelines still pack a lot of punch, more than in most states as I understand it. So the moral of the story is, I don't think we're getting rid of plea bargaining, and I'm too realistic to suggest otherwise. I also don't think all pleas are bad, but I think the amount of leverage that goes way out of proportion to retributive, proportion, uh, 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 retributive culpability is the kind of thing we ought to check and balance. So judges are one possible check. Judges at sentencing do much more in state systems than federal systems do. Another, other possible checks are how could we do some, have some jury-like input into the system? I don't think we're recreating jury trials for 95% of cases. And I do think there's something to the critique that we've made jury trials so long and so cumbersome and so ornate that we can't afford to give them to people. But I also seriously doubt with the precedents and all that we're ever going back to the streamlined <laughs> jury trials of the 18th century. So could we think about sentencing juries? Could we think about sentencing juries for sentences over a certain level? Are there ways in which we could move, husband our criminal justice punishment and stigma for the more serious cases and triage more of them out of the criminal system or at least use pretrial probation to hold it over people's heads such that they're not going to get the book thrown at them unless they you know, a, a persist with a, 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 you know, in the state system if you've had a minor crime, that might be enough of a deterrent to going and committing a more serious crime. I don't have the answers here. The point is the framers had their eye on the dangers of, of royal oppression. And they're not exactly the same. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes. And I understand why some people fear that this hidden low vis visibility discretion that's largely unchecked without a lot of rules and standards uh, is something to be feared and something that occasionally uh, results in abuse or even the conviction of the innocent. Thank you, Judge. And because you had to go first, uh, why don't we offer you a rebuttal? Sure. Sure. Thank you very much, Judge, and thank you for, for those perspectives. Let me try to just hit on a few points that were mentioned and then uh, we'll do some Q&A. With respect to the public participation uh, issue that has been raised, as I mentioned at the outset, it, it is nice in, in theory that we would have more trials that the populace would be more engaged in serving on juries and watching trials, et cetera. And that was a big point, as many of you I'm sure know, in that Judge Goodwin from West Virginia has made in a couple of decisions in which he has rejected uh, plea deals and drug cases. But again, there is no constitutional right uh, that belongs to the people to watch jury trials or to have them happen in cases where the parties don't want to have them happen. And let's face it, this, this may sound a, a little cynical, but I, those of us who have made our livings in and around the courthouses know this to be true. If we are all of a sudden to have 90% jury trials as opposed to 90% guilty pleas, no one would show up to watch those trials. I mean, the, the typical trial uh, includes in the audience maybe one of the lawyer's mothers, uh, and, and a couple of interested people who may have wandered by and maybe a couple of high school students who are there to get extra credit for their <coughs> service class. But there, there's not a clamor I would respectfully submit on the part of the public to be able to watch more uh, jury trials. In fact, if you've ever encountered a friend or a neighbor who received a jury summons to serve on a jury, what's the first thing you hear? A complaint about having to serve on the jury. Uh, forget about them going to watch one voluntarily. So I, I just think, again, though, all snarkiness aside, 
it's really, it's a matter of a defendant's right, not the public's right that we're talking about here. The innocent defendant's uh, problem, I'll put that in quotes, uh, is, is troubling to say the least to the extent it occurs, and we know it does occur, but in very, very isolated situations. It's a, it's a one-off, it's an anomaly, it's not by any stretch a, a, the norm, certainly not in the federal system, but I would submit in the state system, it's, it's far from the norm as well. It doesn't mean it's not a problem when it does exist, but it's not a problem that, in my view, results from the proliferation of plea bargaining. With respect to the coercive uh, argument, what, what, uh, what makes some deals seem coercive because of the great disparity between the sentence agreed to or the, the charge agreed to and the potential charges and the potential sentence is simply a function of what the statute, the relevant statute provides combined with what the sentencing guidelines suggest. You put those two, two things together and if you have multiple counts, that's a big number. The fact that the prosecution is oftentimes, most oftentimes willing to accept a smaller number for the certainty of a plea, in my mind, doesn't constitute a defect in the system. In fact, that's a very good thing for, for most defendants, to have the ability to not face the maximum possible sentence and instead agree to something that's much, much more uh, reasonable and less onerous. The public defender's issue uh, is, is interesting to me because I, I can and tell you, and I'm sure Judge Bevis had a similar experience with public defenders in the Southern District. They are, for the most part, very good, very aggressive lawyers for whom I have the utmost respect. They weren't afraid of me when I was the U.S. Attorney. They weren't afraid of my AUSAs, and they were not afraid of the judges. If they thought a case had to be tried, they tried it. Even if they thought the case couldn't be tried or shouldn't be tried, but their, their, their client wouldn't agree to a plea, they tried it. They did their best. The last case I tried personally as U.S. Attorney was a bank robbery case. The defendant, long story short, had robbed, I think, three banks, a credit union, two 7-Elevens, and a casino cage. This was in Las Vegas. In the span of about a week, most of those robberies were, were, were captured on surveillance video. Public defender couldn't get his guy to plead. Uh, and it went to trial. Judge wasn't unhappy. He just saw it as part of the job. It's probably a slam dunk winner for the government, but if the defendant wants to try it, let's try it. So I just don't think there's this built-in resentment or reluctance on the part of the system participants, the judge, the government, the public defender's office, to take cases to trial when the defendant wants to exercise that right. The trial penalty issue is interesting as well. So as much as there arguably is a trial penalty, there's also a trial bonus, and we've alluded to that. If the defendant feels as though he or she is innocent and wants to go to trial, yeah, the odds are stacked against the defendant in most criminal cases, but there's, there's a case right now somewhere in this country where a jury is deliberating and it looked like it was probably going to be a slam dunk for the government and that defendant's going to be acquitted today. It happens all the time. And so that's the trial bonus, I would submit, that exists when a, when a defendant exercises his or her right to go to trial. I would also point out that what we haven't talked about here, and I know it's, it's a, there's a difference here, so I want to acknowledge that right up, up front. In the civil system, the civil litigation system, Mandatory settlement conferences and mediations and, and everything that can be done to try to get the parties to settle their disputes is just part of the system now. And if someone were to suggest, well, too many civil cases are, are settling, and it's, it's also 90% plus, I think that would be laughable, right? We, we, all, we all like the idea that civil cases typically settle. It's more efficient. And some would say, well, in the criminal system, the difference is, of course, we're talking about somebody's liberty. But again, I get back to that someone is the defendant, and it is his or her right to decide whether to roll the dice or to work out a deal. 
And so finally, uh, I would, uh, let me just look at my notes here. I don't want to go on too long. Um, the Sixth Amendment issue. So, the Sixth Amendment provides for a trial by jury, but case law, of course, as we all know, has over time really explained that to mean that in serious felonies, there's a jury trial right. And even then, the defendant can waive their right to a jury trial and choose a bench trial. But even then, the defendant can simply accept a deal and avoid trial altogether. So the Sixth Amendment, I think it's clear, does not mandate that criminal cases be tried against the wishes of the defendant. So again, I would, I would just finally submit that the bottom line is that with no constitutional defect undermining the plea bargaining system, that common sense and the simple realities of our system dictate that it has to be part of the system and it has to be up to the parties with approval by the court as an option in every criminal case. Uh, thank you. And now for the panelists, do you have any questions you would like to ask each other or I can proceed to my questions? I'd be curious what the ethics rules and the DOJ rules are that, can, that, that, that Greg referred to. Yeah, sure. Just in general, I would say that the ethical rule is that, that a lawyer simply can't charge uh, a case without having the evidence to support that case. And that's just, I think, fundamental. And uh, I, I wouldn't want uh, to be the AUSA who uh, goes before DOJ's OPR for having indicted cases <coughs> with no evidence. I and mean, that's just, I think, ethics 101. And beyond that, look, the, the department policy, uh, unless it's changed recently, and I don't think it has, it has for some time been that, that the U.S. attorneys will charge the most serious, readily provable offense that they can. No less and no more. And so within those confines, the idea of overcharging or charging to obtain leverage despite not having the facts to prove those counts at trial is simply unethical. So I, th I think I'd just add, I think when, when Clark and others use the phrase coercive pleas, they're not talking about prosecutors who are making up facts that don't exist. Instead, they're talking about prosecutors who are threatening to bring charges that they otherwise wouldn't bring or offering to dismiss charges that they aren't actually interested in getting convictions for in order to pressure people to plead. So for example, the US Sentencing Commission issued a report a few years ago on child pornography offenses, because there's this weird thing where um, possession of child pornography has no mandatory minimum, but receipt of child pornography has a five-year mandatory minimum. Can you possess child pornography without having knowingly received it? I don't know, that sounds like a fun law school hypothetical, the point is the Sentencing Commission found, they did a huge study of thousands of cases across the country and they found the only distinctive factor, right? The only thing that distinguished possession cases from receipt cases as charged by U.S. attorney's offices across the entire country was how quickly the defendant offered to plead guilty. And from my perspective, that suggests that A, they're not following the seri most serious, readily provable offense, and B, that that charge is being used only to pressure people to plead guilty. And I haven't seen the Sentencing Commission do a similar study about 924C charges, that's the additional five-year mandatory minimums that has to run consecutively to any sentence um, if you use a, or possess a gun in connection with a drug crime or what have you. Um, but when I was clerking, that was the only time that those charges showed up. They showed up in superseding indictments where people wouldn't plead to everything. I'll just add, there's another common federal prosecutors all know about the phone count. This almost never gets charged against a defendant initially. What happens is the defendant is charged with actual drug dealing, and then mysteriously when he agrees to plead guilty, there's a superseding indictment where he pleads guilty using a phone in a drug deal. And the only reason for that is the phone count has, at the time, I, I think it was a four-year maximum sentence instead of the five or 10, or the 10 or 20-year minimum sentence. Um, so that the strong correlation with whether you went to plea or trial that you got that count. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to add in another thing. You notice we've been talking about the rights of defendants, but I, almost absent from our conversation has been the rights of victims. And since I'm a judge, I need to be careful to say, I'm not saying as a matter of positive law or normatively they ought to be symmetrical. 
And I do recognize that there are victims' bills of rights out there, but they're, 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 they're kind of tepid, but there are some rights to at least be notified of plea bargains, et cetera. But even if you think the defendant can make the right decision for himself or herself, you might be concerned as a matter of agency cost why the prosecutor in this will make the right decision that at least takes into account the victim's interest as well as the public. I mean, a lot of people here get the problem of agency costs with administrative agencies. Well, the prosecutor's another kind of agent and may wear the white hat, may be the good guy. I'm not saying anything otherwise. But I do think that the interest of the victim and whether they're being translated properly in a, in a plea bargain is, is an important concern. And there's not a lot of structure to the way that the prosecutor takes those interests into account. If, if I could just respond to the sure. last point, Judge. That's a very good point, Judge, the, the rights of the victims. And we, you're right, we have not talked about that. And that's a, that's a significant and difficult dilemma for prosecuting offices because as much as um, prosecuting offices and police departments, federal law enforcement agencies do care deeply about victims' rights and try their very best to take care of victims, inform victims, uh, notify victims. In fact, every U.S. Attorney's Office has a victims' rights you know, coordinator who does nothing but that. Uh, it's still tough. I, I can recall uh, accepting a plea in a, a white-collar Ponzi scheme sort of case, um, a Madoff type case on a much smaller level, and uh, hearing from victims who, who lost their life savings in some cases. Um, and the plea was absolutely the right thing. I think we were getting a 20-year sentence, if I recall. But from the victim's perspectives, and I heard this from more than, one, more, more than one victim, the question was, well, I think that the defendant should get the death penalty. And <laughs> it, it's a tough thing to respond to as, as a prosecutor. And of course, I would say something like, well, you know, we, we really, we don't do that. The system doesn't allow for executing uh, fraud defendants. That's just not, and, and the response routinely would be, why not? That was my life savings. And so it is a very difficult thing, and I think offices do their very best to take into consideration the victim's concerns, but, but again, it's, it's, it's really at bottom the defendant's right, not the victim's right. Yes, Mr. Neely. <clears throat> at, at the risk of giving opposing counsel more time at the podium, I, I have a question as well. Um, <laughs> there's a, for those who are familiar with this area of law, there's a famous uh, 1978 Supreme Court case called Bordenkircher v. Hayes, the question in that case was whether the following uh, series of events was or was not unconstitutional. Um, a man in Kentucky was uh, prosecuted for passing an $88 bad check uh, for which the uh, statutory range was two to 10 years. The prosecutor offered five years in a plea and told the defendant, if you don't take that plea, I will go and re-indict you as a habitual offender because you have two prior convictions and that will be life. The, in the case, it is acknowledged that the prosecutor made that threat for the express purpose of discouraging the defendant, Mr. Bordenkircher, from exercising his constitutional right to a jury trial. And I ask, Greg, do you, putting aside ethics and, and law, do, would you just descriptively, would you say that that is or is not coercive? It, it could certainly be interpreted that way. And, and uh, <laughs> I, just say. <laughs> And I'll rely on my counsel to the right of me to tell me I don't have to say anything further if I, if I don't want to. Yeah, look, there are, especially uh, in the state systems, historically, we can point to any number of what might seem to most in this room as abusive tactics by prosecutors that has existed. And that also is probably happening somewhere in this country today, uh, somewhere. It shouldn't, but it is. It's part of the system. But again, it's, it's not the way the system is supposed to work. Those things... Uh, I think are, are rare um, and, uh, um, you know, should be, should be called out when they're discovered. And I have a question uh, for Mr. Neely and Professor Hessick. Um, we were talking about the most serious, readily provable offense. Does that in and of itself set up the concerns that you're expressing with the plea bargaining system, that if a prosecutor is going to be charging with that standard, does, is that what's causing all of the issues you're talking about, or at least contributing to them? So that standard is, is, is one that makes sense, right? If we have a set of statutes that tell us what's good and bad and how much to punish them, it seems like um, 
in a rule of law system, we would tell prosecutors, right, you made it, maybe you don't have to charge every single crime that occurred, but you should find the one that's most serious that you think you could actually prove at trial, and that's the one you should charge. Like, that makes perfect sense. What doesn't make sense to me is that if you look in the congressional record, you will find efforts being made to either increase uh, mandatory minimum, to either establish mandatory minimum sentences or efforts um, pushing back against reform um, to repeal or reduce those mandatory minimum sentences. And you will see people um, from the Department of Justice say that those mandatory minimums can't be repealed, that you shouldn't be um, bamboozled by the fact that the text would seem to reach very low level players. They use those statutes to pressure people to cooperate. So don't think to yourself, is a five year mandatory minimum sentence the appropriate sentence for this crime? Think to yourself, do we want people who do really bad things to go to prison? If you give us this mandatory minimum, we will let people plead to a lower crime and we can use this sentence to pressure them to cooperate literally in the, in the congressional record. So I guess that's where I find myself saying, I appreciate that that's the memo that the US Attorney's Office has received from the Attorney General, but at the same time, you have DOJ telling Congress, give us mandatory minimums that we actually don't expect to use. We you know, aren't going to argue that they're appropriate sentences. We are going to use them to pressure people to flip. Uh, yes, Mr. Brown. What? If I could, oh, excuse me, Dr. Just real quick. Please um, take all the time. <laughs> <laughs> filibuster till five here. Uh, that's a, it's a great point, Professor. It really is, and so and that leads me to a, a thought that I've had as as we've been here today and as I've been preparing for this. That a lot of um, the criticism of the system um, really points back to the legislature and the mandatory minimums, the statutory ranges, et cetera. And as the, the judge uh, mentioned in my introduction, I, at the state level, had the privilege of serving uh, five terms, uh, five sessions in, in my home state legislature in Nevada. And if, if, if for every jury trial I've done, I've lost a year of my life, for every legislative session I've done, I've lost two years of my life, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, but that, that really is, I think, a big part of what we're talking about. You know, DOJ, this sounds, um, maybe like a, a cop-out, but it's, I think we all know what I'm talking about when I say that DOJ just takes what's given by Congress in terms of um, everything from the mandatory minimums that exist to statutory ranges to the guidelines themselves, which are approved by Congress, and has to work within those constraints. Now, DOJ has a lot of latitude and a lot of discretion within those constraints, but a lot of the anomalies that, that we, some of us think we see when it comes to plea bargaining that relate to the threat of the mandatory minimum, right? let's go talk to Congress. And that, and that debate is actually happening right now on the Hill with respect to this, this piece of legislation that's pending. But that, that is, that's where that buck stops, in my opinion. And, 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 oh, go ahead. So, and, I have to say, I think that really sells DOJ too short. Uh, I think it really sells the creativity of DOJ lawyers far too short that they're just stuck with what Congress hands them. Let me, let's talk about what whether readily provable offense, it, what that actually means by way of discipline, um, disciplining you know, DOJ conduct, and we'll do it in the form of an audience quiz. Who can tell me what the, what, what, what the following have in common? Senator Stevens, Yates, Bond, Solomon, Bundy, Enron. These are all cases that DOJ prosecuted and went to trial and resulted in debacles, debacles for DOJ. DOJ took the position in all of those cases that presumably they had a readily provable offense, and oh my, no. Um, some of them went down the tubes because of extraordinarily creative interpretations of laws, such as that a fisherman who threw fish overboard was engaged in document destruction. Um, the Bond case, of course, was a woman who uh, smeared some caustic uh, element on a doorknob to get back at a, at a friend who had become pregnant by her, the other woman's husband. They charged that under the, the International Chemical Weapons Treaty. Um, uh, Noor Salman was the wife of the Orlando um, uh, nightclub shooting. Um, she was acquitted by a jury. The federal district judge was very angry at the prosecution in that case for some information they withheld. The Bundy case, of course, was an unlosable case in Nevada um, that the trial judge, the federal district court judge, dismissed with prejudice because of prosecutorial misconduct. And for those who forget, the Enron case did result mostly in plea, um, in, in plea convictions, but there were six cases that went to trial and resulted in convictions, and five of those were reversed on appeal. Consider what we are missing. 
when 97% of criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargain, and we don't get an opportunity to see which, how many of those cases would have blown up just like the ones that I listed. I'd like to know. And, and, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, Clark, and I'm afraid to say that I could, I could add to your list. I mean, there are, there are, <laughs> there are, there are more than that, unfortunately. And it's it, those of us, um, certainly those in the department and those of us who are veterans of the department, wince, to say the least, every time we see, see one of those situations. It, it does happen from time to time. Sometimes, sometimes I have to say it's, 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 a, it's a judge that just got it wrong, but vociferously got it wrong. And and is out to get the department, but sometimes the department just screws up. That, that is absolutely true. But those are outliers, uh, and though they, um, they, they don't really... Uh, well, are they outliers by definition because they went to trial? Well, no, I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's the, the, the defendant, again, has, has that... It's just, I get back to it's the defendant's right. It's not... It, you know, I don't know what we do with that other than let the defendant decide if, if they want to roll the dice or, or, or take a deal. And um, I'll stop there. And, and Mr. Brower, I have one question for you before I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So you, you've listened to the other panelists and they have identified what they perceive to be problems with the plea bargaining system. Um, are, there, do you, uh, are there any solutions that you see? Is it a legislative fix? It's, it's hard, frankly, to see a solution. It's interesting to talk about potential solutions, but I think if, if we had another couple of hours, we could run each potential solution to ground and find that we probably agree that that wouldn't quite work. Um, I think there, there are two solutions that I would throw out there. They're not really solutions, but they're, they're, they're principles that um, I, I guess the executive branch and the legislative branch need to keep in mind um, as we talk about this problem that the third branch has, um, arguably. Uh, the first is the, the absolute necessity to ensure that the U.S. attorneys making these decisions are the, the best possible people that can be put into those positions. And I know that's a very fuzzy you know, concept that sounds great in principle, but I will tell you, and I, we all know this, uh, the U.S. attorney in any particular district has enormous power over all of these issues. And I would submit to you, I'll, I'll let others judge my tenure, but let me just say that, that the U.S. attorney who doesn't make it his or her mission to closely supervise what his or her AUSAs are doing and, and it's hard to supervise. In the Southern District, Judge, uh, hundreds of AUSAs. You know, in Nevada, 50 AUSAs and districts in between. It's, it's hard, but it's, and mistakes will be made. And the U.S. Attorney can't catch everything, but it's, it's just got to be the mission of every administration, every DOJ, to, to do its very best due diligence to make sure that those U.S. Attorneys that are being selected are the best and that there are checks and balances on, on their powers. That's um, number one. Number two, I get back to um, the, the first branch. If, if, if mandatory minimums, for example, are a big part of the perceived problem here, um, yes, there are arguments in favor of the necessity of mandatory minimums, but there are also good arguments in favor of eliminating or reducing the number of statutes with mandatory minimums. And I, I think, you know, Congress needs to take a hard look at that. Well, thank you. And I'd like to turn it over to the audience. We have two microphones. And I will tell you if, uh, good, I see some people standing up. If you weren't going to stand up, there are people from Atlanta in the audience, and I was just going to start calling on them. <laughs> so you're helping all of those uh, who are members of the Atlanta Mafia, uh, whether they knew so or not. Um, and I'm going to start over here. Um, so with a quick preface, back in, in 1986, uh, Senator Thurmond and Senator Kennedy got together and uh, there was a bipartisan agreement that we were going to create uh, what became the sentencing guidelines. And one of the primary underlying reasons for that was it was considered wrong on a bipartisan or a pope by ideological basis for person A to go to prison for 10 years and person B to get probation, even sometimes in the same courthouse. Um, there were all kinds of racial permutations to that, but there were also the problem that different judges have very different philosophies of what 
is deserving of a particular sentence. And post Booker, we are now back in that universe. Uh, to the extent we are talking about sentencing guidelines and not mandatory minimums, we are seeing judges engage in the exact same behavior that the guidelines were designed to ameliorate or eliminate. And I was wondering what any of the panelists uh, think about that, particularly in the context of has it affected uh, uh, plea bargaining? Who would like to take that? I could try Let's, to start. Right. Um, and then would ha be happy to hear from others. I, I, I don't know. That's a great question. And, and look, the genius of the guidelines, um, especially when they were mandatory, despite the, the eventual, uh, eventually revealed constitutional infirmities, uh, was that it, it, they did, in effect, ameliorate the problem that was alluded to. That is, you know, let's just say, for example, the African-American bank robbery defendant um, in, in Alabama would no longer receive a harsher sentence than the same sort of defendant in San Francisco. That was the idea, and there's a certain genius to the way that was done. Uh, and in fact, in my home state of Nevada, we don't have sentencing guidelines, and I, I've long been a proponent of, of going to a federal-type system. Uh, I don't know that there's enough evidence yet uh, to know what, if any, of the effect Booker has had on, uh, and its progeny have had on, on that. My sense is that judges are more or less following the guidelines despite their advisory nature, but I, I would be, uh, I'd be open to um, suggestions to the contrary by those who may have studied it recently. But, um, but that, that, that system just in general, the system of uniform guidelines guiding judges in very different parts of the country to, to deal with similarly situated defendants who have, who have committed similar crimes uh, the same makes a lot of sense and, and should be the way it works in my view. Yeah, I would just add I think that um, what's happened in the wake of Booker really depends on where you are. Some, some districts uh, judges vary more than others. Um, I'd say I think one big problem with the sentencing guideline is once we sat down and tried to figure out what made people similarly situated and what made them differently situated, we actually realized it was a way more complicated task. Um, and. Uh, and the guidelines that ended up being written. If, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend, it's a bit dated at this point, the book by Professor Kate Stith and, and Judge Jose Cabranes that talks about the particular guidelines that were chosen and why they were so problematic and how more happened with the adoption of the guidelines than just trying to make sentencing similar. It was also made significantly more severe. All right, um, let's take a question from over on that side. Yes, thank you for coming here and speaking today. A, n a number of scholars have pointed out that, the fe that federal enforcers rely heavily on the resources of local uh, police officers and enforcers. For example, local officers make most of the arrests for convictions that occur in federal court. They convey a lot of the information that is used by federal prosecutors. How, if at all, does this interaction play positively or negatively into plea bargaining? Well, there's, a, it, there's really very little in the way of rules that governs when a joint federal state task force decides to take something federal rather than state. And so you might imagine that the principle would be what has the most interstate effects. And sometimes that's true. If a conspiracy spans several states, it's easier as a matter of venue and subpoenas and things to get the witnesses together in federal court. Sometimes it's a matter of, well, who deserves the most punishment or who has the longest criminal record or where do we need to draw cooperators or, or witnesses from. The federal system is more set up for multi-defendant cases involving cooperation. But there's, uh, the evidence I'm aware of suggests a fair amount of randomness or chance in terms of whether the tip happened to come to the cop or the FBI agent and whether that person had a good relationship with somebody in the DA's office or the federal office. I mean. My sense is more often the feds get first dibs, but um, you know, there's not a lot of good rules or policies to, to structure this. And it went, it went so far that 30 years ago, Rudy Giuliani, when he was um, US attorney in Manhattan, announced Federal Day. There was gonna be one random day a week where all the drug cases were gonna go federal. And well, you know, he was gonna show off that he was doing a lot. Uh, Problem is, it's actually the, the worst way to deter because the people just put off their drug deals till the next day. Um, but uh, it doesn't strike me as a really measured, kind of respectful of federalism and the Commerce Clause kind of way to allocate which cases go federal and which cases go state. Anyone else? 
We'll take over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Barr, you said something that was very intriguing. Uh, I've had dozens of cases where it got to the point where the defendant did not accept the plea. And then I'm from Kentucky, so I'm very familiar with that case. The Commonwealth's attorney says, oh, well, I'll just indict you for persistent felony offender, which takes a 1 to 5, then to a 5 to 10 on a low-level felony. You, you mentioned that, well, if the prosecutors are doing that, you should go report it. But if you have an, in our state, we have elected prosecutors, and the prosecutors, that may be their, what they do. And that may be how they run their office with their assistant prosecutors. So who, who, when you have situations like that that obviously are putting it in a course of nature yeah. and situation, what do you do as a member of the defense bar when that is the policy of the office of the elected commonwealth's attorney? So, Yeah, that's a great question. And, and if, you know, if it doesn't otherwise constitute a violation of some state bar rule or some ethical rule or a court rule, um, that's the problem with elected prosecutors, in my view. You know, I used to... My S FBI SAC and I in Las Vegas used to talk often about how lucky we were, frankly, that unlike the elected DA and the elected sheriff in Clark County, we didn't have to worry about politics or what people thought. We just did the right thing every day as best we saw it and didn't have to worry about that nonsense. And so, um, but as a result, we had, uh, we were under the kind of the umbrella of DOJ to, you know, enforce that we did the right thing, right? With an elected, um, uh, an elected uh, DA, yeah, that's that's an interesting dilemma. Because uh. if you do take it to the next level and file, sorry, Judge, I don't mean to ask a follow-up, but um, <laughs> if the but only I am. <laughs> if the only remedy, it's an actus reus, not a mens rea. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the only remedy is to then file something with the disciplinary council, I mean, you're as someone who may practice criminal law on a frequent basis, you're you're kind of that guy who yeah. did that and your clients are never going to, you know, th yeah. there will be other re uh, repercussions well, if you and, do that. And compound that with elected judges mm -hmm. who may be afraid to rein in that elected DA right. because they have to run again and they don't want to be appear to be against, uh, you know, law enforcement or it's yes. And I, I, I hope I'm not going to have to jump in here as a former elected judge, but, uh, but, I'll, but I'll Judge, could I, could I respond to yes. this? So it turns out there's actually an app for this. Um, <laughs> and, and it's this wonderful thing called a founding era jury. And actually during the founding era, era, jurors were told something that modern day jurors are not. And that is the punishment that the defendant will likely receive if they convict. And this was the, to enable them to exercise the two roles that juries have throughout a thousand years of Anglo-American history exercised and used to exercise in America up until less than a century ago, and that is the fact-finding role that they still exercise and the injustice-preventing role that is sometimes referred to as jury nullification but is more accurately referred to as conscientious acquittal. This, this was a founding era practice that was very much in the mind of the, the people who wrote our Constitution. And the idea was that if the prosecution cannot go to bat for the punishment that they are threatening the defendant with, then it is permissible and indeed perhaps even laudable for the jury to acquit, even a factually guilty defendant. And what I would propose, and I think is coming regardless of how prosecutors feel about it, is that juries from now on should be informed um, of the likely punishment for the defendant if they convict. Um, there are two ways to do that, by the way. One is to request that the judge give the instruction. That is impermissible in some jurisdictions. Actually, in other jurisdictions, it's an open question. The other way is for ordinary citizens to simply communicate that information. My wife was called for jury duty, in, actually, in, uh, ironically enough, in front of the very judge that I clerked for, Royce Lamberth, um, so she didn't get seated. But um, if that had been a drug, let's say a drug prosecution, um, and she came home one night and said, you know, I'm really troubled. This guy's definitely guilty. He was definitely selling drugs, but he seems like a good guy. He seems like maybe he just fell off the wagon. He's selling a few drugs to support his habit. Um, I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable convicting him. Can you, can you figure out what's likely to happen to him if we convict? If I go and get that information and share it with my wife, that is felony jury tampering. And that raises very serious First Amendment concerns that a, a, me saying, just sharing truthful information with my wife about that case could be prosecuted by the government as jury tampering when, that, when I'm doing something that is precisely consistent with founding era practice. They would essentially be trying to impose a completely novel um, a vision of the jury as being solely about fact finding that is inconsistent with 1,000 years of Anglo-American precedent. I would like to tee that issue up 
in court as a First Amendment issue, and in fact, my colleagues at IOKDO are working on doing that. Hmm. And Interesting. I, just, I know we need to get to the next person, but um, I study elected prosecutors. Can you find me after? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And, and I would like to find out how a former prosecutor feels about the issue of jury nullification. Mr. Brown? Conscientious acquittal. Yeah, I was, um, I was just going to Clark, as you know, your wife violated the judge's admonition when she came and talked to you as well. But, uh, that, but that's not a felony, though. So. Um, to be clear, she was never seated. <laughs> uh, jury nullification. Um, yeah, you know, um, I'd like to think that, that, that good prosecutors make the best call they can on, on whether and how a case should be indicted. Um, but good prosecutors also know that it, it's never a slam dunk. Um, and uh, sometimes juries, for whatever reason, you know, witness goes south on you, it, it, a jury just sees the evidence differently than, uh, than the, the lawyers in the government office saw it. Um, it's, it's just, it's, the jury can, can do that. I mean, it does do that. It's the de facto, as was mentioned, a, a de facto uh, option that the jury has, uh, if not a completely legal one. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm not sure what I think of it other than uh, I always tried to avoid it. <laughs> <as a prosecutor>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and let's go over here. Uh, yes, my name is John Hayes. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I would like to initially address this to Mr. Neely and then uh, hear what the others may have to say. Uh, I am a civil lawyer. I've, I think I've been involved in one criminal case in my entire career where I was appointed by the federal judge to be the assistant attorney to defend someone. Uh, and that did go to trial because he would not, uh, over our advice, would not agree to plea bargain. But I was struck and would like to hear the comments on the validity of the analogy to just civil settlements because I've been involved in countless civil settlements over the years, both of lawsuits and with regulatory agencies. And a couple things strike me as radically different, and I'd like to hear the comments on it. One, in civil settlements I've been involved in, nobody was facing time behind bars. And at least to most of us, that's far more serious than just facing paying out money, even if it's most of my life savings. And secondly, when we do a civil settlement, including a mediation, we heard analogy to that, I tell my clients, we don't want to go into a mediation until we've done full discovery and gotten the information from the other side. And it's my understanding, we normally don't have that in the criminal process. And I tell them that we need to have a heads up. We also need to make sure that nobody's bought off a witness against us, if we can, uh, by offering favorable terms in another deal. And I'd like to hear the comments on that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. You, you and I are both from Texas, so I'm going to share an expression I learned when I was practicing law uh, in Dallas from my, um, my mentor. Um, it, it was a different setting, but I'm going to adopt it for this setting. Um, you know, in, in a criminal plea negotiation, the role of the defendant is very much like the role of the pig in a ham and egg breakfast. The chicken participates, but the pig is fully committed. Um, <laughs> Prosecutors have basically no skin in the game during a plea negotiation, and we know this based on, you know, the number of years that they'll offer up, you know, the, the Aaron Schwartz where they charge him with 35 years, and prosecutors are like, but, you know, well, let me just give you 34 and a half years. It's like they're playing with Monopoly money. Uh, that's not a true negotiation because the defendant absolutely has skin in the game. Think about if you were involved in a plea negotiation, how, what the, the value or the, 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 you know, the, the cost that you would assign to every additional year in prison. You're probably looking at 500000 or a million dollars you know, per extra year in prison. That is a very real, tangible cost to you. And you've got a prosecutor across the table who's basically playing with monopoly money. What do they care if it's 30 years or 20? Um, and so they have this tremendous ability to go up and down that is not matched by your ability to go up and down. And Judge Beavis mentioned that, um, I think, during his talk. And, and so the other thing that I want to underscore that he, he pointed out as well is that in a negotiation, in a true negotiation, the counterparty doesn't have the ability to just sort of, you know, arbitrarily set whatever it is you're negotiating over whatever level they want to. I mean, we could probably get to a 100% plea, uh, plea bargain rate in this country if we just made the penalty for every crime life without the possibility of parole. 97%? Those are rookie numbers. 
Um, so the, that's, that's the, the, I think, one of the biggest differences between a true, and I've, I've, I was a civil lawyer throughout my career, and I've been in plenty of negotiations, and I didn't get to just move the goalposts whenever it uh, served my negotiating position, but that's exactly what the government gets to do um, in the criminal justice system writ large, not necessarily in the context, well, actually, uh, yes, necessarily in the context of a specific plea negotiation. You can always go back and reindict for conspiracy or habitual offender if you want to up the, um, if you want to up the cost to the defendant. So I think there's basically zero uh, comparison between a civil plea, uh, civil uh, negotiation and a, and a criminal plea negotiation. But there doesn't have to be, right? Um, you could have motions to dismiss, you could have right. um, complete discovery and depositions, you could have motions for summary judgment, you could have all of these rules. And in fact, when the federal rules of criminal procedure were initially written, they were written by the same folks who wrote the federal rules of civil procedure and they were going to do them the same. And then at the last minute they decided not to because they thought, um, it might be too onerous for one side. I'm happy to refer you to a law review article about that if you're interested. Um, but you might think to yourself, well, that sounds crazy. Why would you have like a real motion to dismiss? How would you have like full discovery with depositions? How would you have summary judgment in, in, a, in a criminal case? But actually, if you look around the country in different state systems, you can find pieces of these things in different systems. So our system, if we want our criminal justice system to be a system like the civil system, where the assumption is we really hope that you settle, we could change the procedures to look like that instead of wholly failing to regulate it, which is what we do right now, and we can see it actually happen in other courtrooms in different places, at least piecemeal, if we want to. Yeah, uh, just two things real quick to my, my civil colleague. Thank, thank you for that question. So first of all, in the federal system anyways, uh, the defendant does have discovery uh, before a plea deal is typically done. I mean, that's what, that's what forces most plea bargains, is the case is indicted, discovery is provided, the uh, defense lawyer looks at the discovery and says, holy cow, uh, we need to get you a deal. Uh, let me tell you what the government has, and a plea bargain is worked out. That's, at least in the federal system, that's the normal way things are done. To your first point, um, I, I've litigated more civil cases than criminal cases like, like you, and I'll tell you that you're right about the difference in exposure in, in civil cases, the exposure is typically money, sometimes a lot of money, and in the criminal case, it's, it's much more important. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one's liberty, um, perhaps one's life. That is why, in my view, it is so important to allow the defendant facing that exposure to make the decision on whether to accept a deal or go to trial. And again, for me, if I've said it twice, I've said it three times now, that's the bottom line. This is a right the defendant has, along with the executive, they come together, they reach a deal, judge doesn't find it's defective, that's got to be the way the case ends. Let's go over here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, maybe the potential costs of separation of powers in this system. Um, it's, I guess among the, you know, the legislators who write those statutes and the guidelines and the prosecutors who are doing their best to follow them. And then there are uh, the public defenders, uh, jurors who aren't told the, you know, the punishments, et cetera. I wonder if, uh, whether and to what extent the sort of responsibility to do justice is so dispersed that uh, it's, uh, um, that the sort of the, the substantive moral order that the criminal law system is trying to uphold gets lost in the shuffle and only more so thanks to negotiations being being put into the mix. Hmm. I, think well, that, I think, go ahead, sorry. That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a hard one. Um, I, I, a very fascinating uh, argument that some have made is that in fact the jury can best be seen as a fourth branch of government and that in order for the government to convict anybody of a crime they should have to clear all four gates so you should have to have the legislature decide to criminalize the conduct. You have to have the executive decide uh, to prosecute it. You have to have the judiciary, uh, you, you know, willing to not dismiss it, at least in theory. Um, but then an absolutely vital part of the system was meant to be that you don't get that conviction unless you can get a supermajority of 12 members of the community to be the final gate and say, yep, that's an appropriate thing to convict somebody of. So in a sense, you could see the jury as a fourth branch of government. Um, and if that is an, you know, a, a potentially valid way of looking at it to, to almost completely eliminate from the process 
um, this kind of quasi fourth branch of government should, should trouble us at least as much as the sort of separation of powers issues that you have raised, um, you know, in terms of the elimination of a mechanism that is absolutely at the heart of American criminal justice, and that's public participation. So Tocqueville actually calls it the, the judiciary bicameral, and the upper house is the judge, like the mm -hmm. Senate, more removed from the people, and the lower house is the jury, uh, it's more directly popular responsive, and you have to get the assent of both before the government can exercise its coercion. And I'm tempted to run out the clock because I see Oren at the microphone, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're actually only going to take one more question because we're running out of time. Um, we're going to take one over here. So this has been a, a terrific panel, and there's been some discussion of the difference between the federal system and state systems, and I was hoping there could be a little bit more discussion of it specifically on the issue of, are, is there any particular system that you think is best? We've got 52 uh, jurisdictions, right? The 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the federal system that are all dealing with these questions. Is there any one that you think handles these intractable problems better than the others? And if so, why? So what I'm aware of, I don't know a lot about military justice, but my understanding is the military justice system has mm -hmm. serious plea, pre, plea review it has vigorous adversarial combat on both sides with you know, rigorous, very good lawyers and a, a very professional judiciary that's, that's skeptical and you know, tosses some cases out, military juries toss some cases out. So going, the problem is the, the difference between trial and plea is so great. The chances that we're going to uh, make our trials in the civilian system so much less costly and safeguarded or almost nil. But the chances we could bring the level of safeguard up in pleas is substantial. So I really like the late Bill Stunts' idea that let's have judges inquire more deeply into the factual basis of pleas than they do in the typical state courthouse in America where you know pleas are entered in a minute or two and sometimes there's not much in a factual basis. And when you get to an Alford or no contest plea, and I know these are not common in the federal system, but a lot of states, five, 10 percent of convictions come from people who either say, I'm not contesting this, or affirmatively, I'm innocent, but I'm pleading guilty. Well, you don't get to do that in the military system. The judge, uh, you really have some, some rigorous checks to make sure that this is not just a collusive deal or, or made up facts, but the judge finds this is what actually happened. So I'm not sure that there's any state that's you know, exactly getting it right, but I do want to end on a really, uh, what I hope is a very optimistic note, and I want to pick up on something Greg said, which is that it, it's so common, it's part of our you know, sort of cultural ethos that you complain, you know, when you get the jury summons, everybody complains, and that's probably true, but you know what? Talk to somebody who's served on a jury and see if they're complaining then. They don't. What people who have served on juries say is that it's one of the most profound experiences that they've ever had in their entire life, and it, it served to reconnect them to this country and to the wonderfully exceptional place that America is and was meant to be. And it is jury service for many people that does that for them. If, if for no other reason, that is a reason to try to pu push down the amount of plea bargaining and bring that back the criminal jury trial, because it connects people um, to what is special about this country, and we've basically eliminated it. I, I really think we have ended on the perfect note with that. Um, and thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to the panel.